come on in and uh, let's stand up and worship God.
Yo 
worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you.
Father in heaven, you are our way-making God. You lead us and guide us through your spirit, through your word, uh, through our church body and family, Lord, and we lift you up. The Bible says that the people living in darkness have seen a great light, that a light has dawned, and, and that light is your son. And as we move closer to the and into the Christmas season, Lord, we dwell on that never-ending light in the darkness, that you shine no matter what happens around us, regardless of our circumstances. Father, you are faithful, and we come here to declare that today, to lift up your name in praise. Almighty God, way maker, light in the darkness. Thank you for your truth, for your word, for your church. Pray that you would bless our time together now and that you would be blessed by it as we offer praise, thanksgiving, and consider your words in Scripture to guide us in how we live. Bless each one here now in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just before you're seated, uh, go and, uh, and bless somebody. You can go to the back of the room or the person right next to you. And by bless them, just simply uh, tell them God loves them or tell them you're glad to see them because we're glad you're here. All right, good. It's good to see everyone. Uh, I have a few announcements to share today. Dave is uh, speaking at a conference in Brantford, and so uh, I'm going to do the announcements uh, as well as the message today. Uh, I have a note here about uh, the, the holiday compassion card drive uh, for families in, in Burlington, and it's an opportunity for people in our church to participate in uh, giving gifts and enabling those in need to, to buy food and uh, things that they need. And so the most common cards families wish for are grocery stores, Walmart, uh, Burlington Center Mall, Ma Maple View Center Mall, Shoppers Drug Mart, and other stores that carry baby items. And uh, if you'd like to participate in that, uh, just choose a denomination that you wish to purchase, 100 50, whatever the denomination is, and then consider donating that gift card over the next two Sundays, so December 4th and 11th, so that we can be an encouragement uh, to families uh, in need in our own neighborhood. And you can just bring them and drop them in the blue box over the next two weeks, or next Sunday, uh, many of you are aware, we're, we're taking the offering physically next Sunday. We're gonna, we're gonna pass the plate uh, as an act of, of worship, and uh, you could also choose that moment to um, release your Compassion gift card uh, so that we can get it to those who, who need them. Uh, what is our potential? What is our potential? Uh, you may have heard me tell the story of the halfway house. You know, it's not uncommon for uh, elite executives to, to go on exotic trips and to take on exotic challenges that might be skydiving or mountain climbing. And the story is told of one group that was making an expedition on a, a 14,000 foot uh, mountain in Colorado. And uh, as they proceeded, they were a unified bunch in good spirits. And, uh, you know, it was cold, the conditions were hard, uh, but uh, they pressed on. And about midway up the mountain, is a place appropriately called the Halfway House. It's a warming station, a place where you could go in and have hot chocolate, uh, warm up by the fire a little bit. It, it's meant to be a temporary refuge and rest. Uh, but as time went on, more and more of the group got kind of cozy and comfortable by the fire, sipping their beverages and uh, enjoying the warmth. And as it turns out, only a, a small remainder of the party continued to walk to the summit, and uh, you could see through the window the, the thin line of these climbers going up higher and higher, and at first the ones who stayed behind were feeling pretty good about that choice, but as they realized that they weren't going to meet the summit, they weren't going to reach the summit, 
uh, they stayed in the halfway house. And a kind of a settled melancholy uh, came over them all because they knew that uh, this potential uh, that was in them uh, was missed and they didn't sum it consequently. And what is our potential Sunday? Is It's a Sunday and it's an exercise as well in uh, getting ourselves focused and retuned into regular church attendance, into the process of asking and inviting and bringing other people to church. Uh, most people who don't go to church don't wake up in the morning thinking, today I'll try out church. But uh, they will often seriously consider it if invited by a friend. So on December 4th, next week, uh, I'd like you to pray about that date uh, because we'd like to see as many seats filled here uh, as we can. We know the banquet, uh, we always see a robust crowd for that. But uh, the What Is Our Potential Sunday kind of works on this principle. You know, what would this place feel like, look like? What would be the vision that we would <laughs> absorb, the, the motivating vision that we would absorb as, as we saw friends, uh, as we saw this, this building full, as we realized uh, uh, a, a great offering, as people come and, and, and give their very best or tithe or go above and beyond it. So uh, December 4th, make sure, uh, even if you're not bringing somebody, that you're here. Okay, it's a big day uh, for us to, to be out and uh, together on that. As I mentioned before, the offering will be a physical offering. And of course, we will not be compelling any of your guests uh, to participate in that. I can assure you, uh, it, it will be handled with grace, but it is. It's an act of worship, and um, I think sometimes when it's done uh, sort of outside of the service, we miss something in our experience of, of group worship to the Lord as we give, as the church is activated to give generously. So there will be a pass the plate Sunday next week and, and, and bring your very best gift uh, we also, I mentioned our Christmas banquet, so that's coming up the very next week, December 11th, and we have postcards available now, and what you can do is, even this week, in advance of what is our potential, or at the very latest, at our what is our potential Sunday on December 4th, make sure, we want to make sure that every guest gets one of these invitations. And it's basically a, a join us for a Christmas banquet and have dinner on us, complimentary Swiss chalet, festive special, gifts for all children ages 12 and under, uh, gift card draws, uh, a few special uh, musical presentations, a few fun things, and uh, uh, the means to RSVP by indicating uh, how many are coming and do you prefer white or dark meat, that sort of thing. But uh, as you leave here today, and hopefully by now you've been praying and thinking about who you might invite, uh, take a couple of cards with you, and during the week, pass them on to uh, your friends. If you have anybody who comes out next Sunday who is your guest, definitely make sure that they get them, because not only are we not going to compel them to participate in an offering, uh, we are going to be a blessing to them. We, we want to set the table and invite people to come and enjoy ministry and fellowship around the table and get introduced to our church family that way. So these postcards will be uh, in the foyer uh, near the welcome area where the coffee and, uh, and debit machine is. Um, so Christmas banquet, again, is coming up uh, December 11th. Men's group is this Saturday, uh, December 3rd. And I believe uh, Mr. Robert Brody, you are hosting it in your home? Excellent. Excellent. Anna, what are you going to be doing? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you don't want to be there when they get there, though. No, gets ugly. Gets ugly. Okay, Abby, Abby Glugosh is back from uh, her trip to, to England and uh, to Kenya. And uh, so uh, thank you for keeping her and uh, her team in prayer. And uh, you might want to send her a little hello or a text and welcome her back and thank her for serving uh, people uh, overseas. And then I think the only other thing I have to do today is uh, 
release the children to their program. Now, there's, don't go yet. Don't go yet. There's no junior youth today, but our regular kids program is happening. But I would like uh, the kids not to leave until the scripture has been read uh, this morning. So, uh, Rob, I believe you have our scripture reading, if you could bring that. And when Rob is done and I'm taking my place, uh, kids, you may go ahead and make your way to your program. Good morning. This is 2 Timothy, chapter 3. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. I'll skip down. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know these from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good word. This is the word of the God. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Last week, last Sunday, I brought a message called Why I Need the Bible. And it was kind of a, it was somewhat introspective, uh, kind of a personal reflection that, that hopefully had a usefulness to, to others as well. Um, and decided that I wanted to continue with that theme uh, for one more Sunday. You may have noticed there was a, uh, one week I got up to, to speak and did a sermon on the book of Ecclesiastes and got intrigued by it and then decided to spend the next four or five weeks or so digging into that. And that's sort of what happened to me this week. I was uh, reflecting on the text and wanting to make sure that uh, we understood it and knew the context and how to apply it in our lives. And so that's what we're doing today. We're revisiting uh, the idea of what the Bible does for us and how it can be useful to us. Now, one of the most intimidating things uh, about being a preacher, especially in your early years as a preacher, when you're a young preacher, a, a new preacher, is that people ask you questions. I mean, all kinds of questions, hard questions, weird questions, and they expect you to know the answer uh, for those questions. You know, uh, uh, I, I was not, uh, I was already in my career when God called us into ministry, and so suddenly, you know, Claudia is a pastor's wife. And I can remember when we were called to, to serve full-time at our first pulpit, and she's going, man, Jim, like, people are going to expect me to know so many things, you know, like, am I going to be able to do this? And she felt a little pressure that way, and I certainly understood that. Quite honestly, uh, there's a lot of questions that we don't know the answers to, even after many years of preaching and studying the Bible. There are still some answers that, 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 that we struggle with. So if you had to guess, what questions do you think preachers hear the most often. I mean, uh, besides where did Cain get his wife, or where did evil come from, or what was the fruit that Adam and Eve ate, or, you know, if God made everything, who made God, or if God can do anything, could he make a rock so big that, that even he couldn't move it? Uh, why did God create mosquitoes? How did they fit all those animals on the ark? Sometimes the questions, though, 
are a little more serious, a little more personal uh, uh, and practical than philosophical is, and you fill in the blank, you fill in the blank here, is blank a sin? Asking for a friend. Is it wrong to fill in the blank? Can I do such and such and still go to heaven? How come God allows this? Does God really care about that? Why doesn't God answer my prayer? Questions, questions, and more questions. Uh, What happens when I die? That question will come up as I uh, share the word at a funeral this, this afternoon. Will I know my loved ones in heaven? Will we still be married in heaven? That's a deal breaker for, for, for some people. Uh, how will I be happy in heaven if uh, some of my relatives aren't there? How will I be happy in heaven if some of my relatives are there, right? I mean, <laughs> but the questions just keep coming. What will we do in heaven? Do dogs go to heaven? I've answered this before real quick. Yes, but not cats. <laughs> now, I've heard all of those questions many, many, many times over the years. But this one, this question is extremely common, and I'm hearing it more, I would say, in the last couple of years than any of the other questions I just raised. And that is this. Preacher, do you think that we're living in the last days? Has that been on your mind at all? Because a lot of people have been asking me that question. And I always feel like I disappoint people when I answer that one and tell them that, you know, generally, when the phrase last days is used in Scripture, I think it appears six times. Uh, It refers to any time since Jesus and the launch of the church. Post-Pentecost, you know, we, we entered into the last days. So it's not just a sliver of time. It's not just a tiny sliver of time at the end of time. But usually, when people ask the question, do you think we're living in the last days, what they're really asking is, do you think we're living in the last days of the last days? Mm -hmm. Well, listen to Paul's words to Timothy, because this is interesting. As I said, there are six references, perhaps, to last days and times specifically, The Bible doesn't say much about what we are to do uh, in those times or to prepare for those times. And an unlikely source of it is in the Scripture, in the words that Paul wrote to Timothy. So what I've done this week is given you greater context, and we've looked at some verses that precede uh, the the Scripture that says, you know, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Um, So if you are interested in what you should do if these are the last of the last days, because 2 Timothy 3, I mean, note this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and get this, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and says, have nothing to do with such people. Last days, what do you think? In fact, Paul continues in that same chapter. He says, everybody who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So, if these things are increasing, if they are accelerating, if you are convinced that we are in the last of the last days, what does Paul say to do? What did Paul tell young Timothy and his immediate audience for this letter uh, to respond to this? What's it mean for us? What's the application for us? Verse 14 It's the same chapter, same thought. Um, But as for you, you know, while all this stuff goes from bad to worse, as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of. Dig in. Continue in what you have learned and become convinced of because you know those from whom you have learned it and how from infancy or childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. Here we go. All Scripture is God-breathed 
and is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and for training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So you might say, I, I don't know what to do if, if these are the end of the end times. Well, Paul tells us right here, continue. Be steadfast in what you've learned. Rely on the book. Let the book shape you. Let the book make your world, and it will. That's one thing we're told that we can and should do. Uh, In other words, uh, Timothy, this is one of those immovable realities. Scripture is God-breathed. You can trust it. Uh, These are words that will lead you to salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. Scripture is useful. It's profitable. It will equip you. It is true even in this crazy, unhinged unhinged culture in the year 2022 of our Lord A.D. Somehow today, Scripture is God-breathed. Scripture was somehow breathed or inspired by the Spirit of God and yet written by the hand of people. We talked about that last week. Peter talks about it in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. He says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. In fact, the next verse, verse 21 says, For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We lift the sails, and God fills the sails and drives our direction. So could we just start today at a most basic level, uh, something that probably won't be a hard sell uh, with anybody here, but, but at the very basic level, at least we should, number one, show some respect and appreciation for Scripture. Show respect and appreciation for Scripture. Um, a couple of years ago in a GQ magazine, they had an article entitled, 21 books you don't have to read before you die. Okay, 21 books you don't have to read before you die. Classics you can ignore. A no need to read list. And I want to quote from that article. They said, we've been told all our lives that we can only call ourselves well-read once we've read the great books. And we tried. The GQ editors say in the introduction to the list, we realize that not all the great books have aged well. Some are racist, some are sexist, but most are just really boring. So we, a group of unboring writers, give you permission to strike these books from the canon. Here's what you should read instead. But among the books that GQ says you don't have to read, well, one of my favorites is in there, The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger, Uh, The Old Man and the Sea, The Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway, Lord of the Rings by J.R. Tolkien. Don't bother. Don't read it. Get this. Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Gulliver's Travels uh, by by, uh, uh, Jonathan Swift. Lonesome Dove by Gene Stafford. And, of course, you don't have to read the Holy Bible. In fact, GQ goes on to say that the Bible is one of the most overrated books ever written. They give it the number 12 spot in their list of 21 books not to bother with. And this is what they say specifically about the Bible. The Holy Bible is rated very highly by all the people who supposedly live by it, but in actuality have not even read it. And those who have read it know there's some good parts, but overall it's certainly not the finest thing that man has ever produced. It is repetitive, self-contradictory, foolish, and even at times ill-intentioned. That's their synopsis. The Bible is the Rodney Dangerfield of books. It gets no respect at all. Never mind that it's the number one bestseller of all time. Never mind that it's well attested to, above and beyond all ancient literature, with manuscripts and manuscript evidence. Never mind that our country and our civilization were shaped by it. Never mind that it has inspired more art and literature and music and poetry than any book in history, never mind that it was written on multiple continents by a diverse group of authors from multiple walks of life, and yet contains a singular unfolding message, the purpose being to introduce us 
and bind us to the person of Jesus Christ. Never mind that its influence has built hospitals, advanced technology, and abolished slavery, and promoted freedom, and undergirded education, and inspired exploration, and catalyzed science and discovery, subdued evil impulses, formed nation builders, instigated compassion, fought poverty, comforted the suffering, and rebuked the oppressor. And never mind that some of the greatest minds in Scripture and outside of Scripture have embraced it and exalted it. Never mind that it has endured the attacks of skeptics and tyrants to eradicate it. People who are much, much, much wiser than the editors of GQ magazine. They got some pushback for this. One of the readers of GQ wrote in and said, even if you don't believe it is the inspired word of God, in the last 50 years, 3.9 billion people have read this book. It is, as author Vishal Mangawati says, whether you're a believer or not, the Bible is the book that made your world. As we get into the book of Exodus in the new year, the Decalogue, the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, our, our whole judicial system is based on the law code in, in the Old Testament and other biblical principles and values. Many of our values that, that, that people wouldn't identify because it's the water they swim in, they don't associate them as being Christian values per se, but there, there are many Christian-ish values in our society. Where did they come from? They came from the book that made our world. The book that made our world. Uh, the Bible. And um, so what about your world? Are you allowing this book to make your world personally? Conversation with Scripture helps address major life questions like, uh, where do we come from? Our origin. Why are we here? What is our purpose? What is meaning about What's right and wrong? Morality. Where are we going? What's our destiny? Uh, author David Young says, will we define the Christian faith using the Bible as our source of authority, complemented by Christianity's rich teachers, the great creeds of the faith, and the witness of the worldwide church? Or, we will sub or will we submit the Christian faith to our own sentiments, our own flawed reason, and the passions of our ever-changing experiences? This, David Young says, is a critical choice. So you can follow the teachings of Scripture given by the prophets and the apostles, some who actually lived and walked with Jesus, or you can follow your own sentiments that are constantly being molded and shaped and directed uh, you know, by, by Western myths of, of progress and political in, interests and uh, competing ideologies. You want to trust those? Or do you want to lean on that book, the book that made your world? Uh, the famous G.K. Chesterton uses the meta metaphor of offense to describe the way we think. You know, some approach an old fence thinking, we need to tear this thing down. We don't need a fence here. What's it here for? It's no longer useful. There's no purpose for it. But others, wise people, say, you know what? Before we remove the fence, it might be good to figure out why that fence was put there in the first place, before we go tearing everything down. Uh, the writer of Proverbs says, be not quick to remove the boundary stones that your fathers have set. So at the very least, we should give some appreciation and respect to Scripture. But giving Scripture some appreciation and respect is not enough. We have to handle Scripture responsibly. Handle Scripture responsibly. Uh, some people handle it irresponsibly because they don't know how to handle it. But the Bible also says that there are people who deliberately twist, distort, use, and abuse the Scriptures in order to gather a following, uh, to seduce others, or uh, to simply get their own way. It's a power move. And, 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 and if you see that, that's not the Scripture speaking. That's that person handling it incorrectly deliberately, or maybe not. Now, some of you have known this verse for a long time. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who, what? Correctly handles the word of truth. 
correctly handles the word of truth. It's part of the reason why I went back to the text this week, uh, so that we could look at the surrounding context. You know, this, this idea that all scripture is God-breathed and useful, Paul doesn't just snatch that out of thin air. It's surrounded by other thoughts, such as, you know, in the last days, these evildoers will, 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 will look like they're prevailing, they'll, they'll, they'll grow, and that's why we need uh, the word. Those verses remind us of the importance of context when we read the Bible, because the Bible is a unique, ancient, compiled, foreign, multi-genre book. You know, I kind of think of the Bible in English, you know, it's, it, because that's all, all we ever do, and, and, and we forget that, uh, you know, it has been translated from antiquity, from Hebrew and Greek, uh, even some Aramaic, uh, languages and cultures that are foreign to us. And so we must seek the context to understand it properly so that we apply it correctly. And so whenever we read anything from the Bible, we need to ask those basic questions that we hopefully learned when we were first taught to study the Bible. To whom is the author speaking? For what purpose is the author speaking? In what era, age, or place is the author speaking? And in what situation and context? See, it's not helpful to reduce study of the Bible to a cliche. You know, even people say, well, the, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. And uh, there's truth in that statement, obviously. But in order to have a statement like that, you have to handle Scripture responsibly. The apostle Peter who walked with Jesus said something in his writings about the writings of his fellow apostle, Paul. Um, Do you ever find Paul difficult to read? Do you ever get into some sections in Romans and other epistles and say, okay, what, what, what exactly is, is going on with what Paul's saying here? And this is what Peter said about Paul. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, about Paul's writings, Peter says, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. It's a serious business uh, to teach the word and to teach it responsibly. You know, I know, I know a lot of times there's um, far too many preachers who, who go along with an approach to preaching where they have an idea that they want to communicate. And so then they flip through the Bible to find texts that match the big idea that they want to speak about, rather than letting the big idea come from the text, if you follow me on that. Okay? So um, when we talk about this, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. Could we just pull something out of that there? And that is when we read scripture, parts of it can be hard to understand. An inspired apostle said that parts of it can be hard to understand. Scripture can be twisted, distorted through ignorance or willful manipulation, malicious ill intent even. So we have to approach it responsibly. And then we have to be discerning when we hear others teach it. So we know that they're not simply using it to make a point they want to make. They're actually giving us the context and handling that word in a responsible uh, way. Um, would you admit that we often approach the Bible with one of two things? A highlighter or a pair of scissors? And we highlight the verses that we like, words that build us up and give us hope. We, we all have those favorite passages that we go back to again and again, things that make us feel good and, and, and give us hope and peace and assurance. And we try to get rid of the mirror sometimes, though. We, we would like to clip out some of the verses that get right up in our face and say, you know what, this is who you really are. This is what you really need to deal with. And you know, and we, we want to clip those things out and, 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 and cherry pick it if it makes us uncomfortable or it goes against our own narrative. So scripture deserves not only our appreciation and respect, but we have to handle it responsibly when we read it. Um, Dr. Gary Collier 
suggests a very helpful method for responsible Bible reading. And he calls it probe. I've put in that uh, acrostic there in, in your outline, P-R-O-B-E. And I'll just highlight it real quickly for you because it can be a useful tool. Now, um, many of you will, when the calendar flips, January 1, 2023, take out a reading plan to read through the Bible in a year. Uh, does anybody do that here in this congregation? It's a wonderful thing. I see some hands. It's a wonderful thing to, to read the entire Bible from cover to cover. Um, we should be doing that multiple times. And there are Bible reading plans that enable us to do that. But, you know, sometimes we get in this, this thing where, you know, it's a large chunk and we rush through it and it doesn't penetrate or percolate or change us because we're just sort of checking a box. Okay, I read my scripture reading for the day. Or you fall behind, and man, you, you fall behind a couple of days, and suddenly it seems like you have a mountain of material uh, to get through, and you can end up saying, am I getting anything out of this at all? So yes, read through the Bible in a year, but also take times uh, to soak up a passage in a way that you truly own it, in a way that it can truly settle into your bones and, and transform you. So um, uh, with the word probe, uh, this is an idea of, of how to spend an entire week, say, on one passage. Let's say uh, 10, 11, 12 uh, verses. And the first day, the P in probe is just to pre-read. To pre-read. You know, don't, don't worry about bearing down too hard. Just pre-read it. Get the overall, you know, the 30,000-foot view. Pre-read it. Read through it a couple of times. You know, you don't have to really camp out on it there. Just, just get the sense of what it is uh, you're reading. You might even want to do it in several different translations. And then the, the, the second day, the R, is to recap. To recap. Read it more purposefully. Uh, maybe in another translation and then just on your own. Not consulting any books not opening the commentaries, not asking anybody else, and you write a short summary of what you think the passage is saying. The third day, the O in probe, is to observe, to read it again, look at it in context, maybe take specific words and, and look at their deeper meaning, look at their origin, look at the etymology, um, these kinds of things. Take specific textual notes. Look for, here's where context comes in. Think carefully about the context. Who was the author? Why did he write it? What was the situation or circumstance? Who did he write it to? When was it written? And you ask um, the author questions. Uh, the fourth day, the B in probe is brainstorm. And in brainstorm, that's where you do consult maybe the commentaries or cross-reference it with other scriptures, or uh, talk to a pastor or your Christian friends or people that you study the Bible with it, about it and begin to, uh, to, to understand it from that perspective. And uh, then the letter E in probe is engaged. Read it again. Tell the author what you learned, like you're having a conversation with the author. Ask the author your main question for the week and ask yourself, what is this text help me think, decide, or do? And what would the author say to us in our own lives, in our own church right now? And let that mirror really reveal. Don't be one who, who looks at it and walks away uh, immediately forgetting what you look like. Uh, it's only useful to you insofar as you read it responsibly and then apply it correctly. And then you have a real weapon. As you begin to own these truths and have them embedded in your heart and in your mind, scripture memorization, all of this, they are useful, especially in times of trial, especially in times of temptation, in times of apprehension or fear. They're useful when you're praying with or encouraging uh, a Christian brother or sister. And um, it's, it's a helpful way of slowly meditating, working through a passage of scripture, so the point is, the Scripture not only deserves our appreciation and respect, we have to learn how to handle Scripture responsibly, and if we don't, it becomes a very destructive weapon. James teaches us about that, and we're going to look at that in a moment. But before we do, let me suggest a third thing we have to do since Scripture is our source of truth, and that is 
we need to let Scripture shape us. This book that made the world, are you letting it make you? It's worth a little time. It's worth a little effort. The streams of our culture that, that, that are just washing us over, in fact, in many ways, bowling people over, young, younger people in particular, who don't know the word, who weren't raised with the word, who have no comprehension of, of what the Bible is about or, or what it says. And so worldly ideologies come at them from all corners, uh, through technology in particular, and they're just blown away by it. And so, yes, appreciate it, respect it, read it responsibly, but then let it shape you. Let it really shape you. Because attention to and application of Scripture helps us bring life back to order. I mean, do you realize the implications of what Paul wrote to Timothy here? He said, all Scripture is God-breathed. Think about that. The same God that breathed breath into your body, right? You, you are made. The, the same God that breathed life into your body through your human parents breathes Scripture into existence through His Spirit and through His human authors. So let's just say it this way. You are God-made, and Scripture is God-breathed. In other words, it's like the oxygen you and I need to live wisely, to build our house on a rock, uh, to survive and thrive in the last days of the last days, if that happens to be where we are. Scripture is God-breathed, and you are God-made. We are God-made, and Scripture is God-breathed. So it's no wonder that balance and bearing and stability come from the words of God. I'll just say it this way. I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine where my life today would be without the influence of Scripture. And I got a long way to go. You say, like, you're, you're not so hot, Jim. Um, well, well, you're right, but you should have seen me before. Um, you know, everything in this world, the, the, the way that the, the knowledge pyramid is built it creates confusion and chaos. Um, the, the pyramid of wisdom uh, begins with the Word of God, the Bible, at the very base, at the very base. And uh, so, so we start there. And um, I don't know really where my life would be if I didn't one day pick up and read and allow it to shape me. I can't imagine of what my moral behavior would be like. I can't even think of what my marriage would be like or my level of concern for other people or my confidence in the eternal destiny of my life or my life purpose or life satisfaction and peace. Man, I don't know where my self-control desires, where those would be, where my anxieties would be. I mean, what that level would be. The benefits go on and on. I can't imagine where my life would be today without the influence of God-breathed Scripture. You know, we're kind of, it's like we're spending an, an inheritance in our Western civilization. Uh, we, we built good laws. Uh, nations and people feared God. And in recent generations, we've sort of trampled on that legacy. We don't realize that the reason why we've prospered and been blessed to the extent that we have is because we shared, there was, there was, there, we, were, we saw ourselves as part of a bigger story. And that bigger story was the gospel. That bigger story was what was taught in the value, in, in, in the Bible. And we got our values from that. And you know, while we all didn't follow them perfectly, we agreed generally, that there were a set of values, a code uh, to live by. And that's crumbling. Uh, that's going by the way. And it's affecting the morality of human beings uh, all over the place. Um, James says it like this in James 1, verse 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. 
Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently, intently, probes, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And I want to be blessed in what I do. You know, I'm not wise enough. Uh, you know, my truth, it doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere good. The truth is what we want. So if we wanted to, you know, kind of put that in steps, the first thing you do is reject and receive. And James says, reject all moral filth and evil. You get rid of that stuff that's so prevalent in our world today. You reject it and you receive, humbly accept the word planted in you. Then it has a chance of shaping you. You listen to it, and then you look intently into it. So you listen, and you look. It's like a mirror that you're looking into. You listen, and then you look intently. You're not just buzzing over. You're meditating on it. You're letting it saturate you. You're letting it shape you. You look intently into it, and then you remember it and do it. Remember and do. Reject and receive. Listen and look. Remember and do. And that's one of the reasons why Scripture memorization is so important. And you know what? It's not hard. Some people say, oh, I can't memorize Scripture. And I understand that, that, that for some people that is true. There is a, uh, everybody has different ways of learning. Uh, people's minds work in, in, in different ways, and for some people, reading is more difficult. Uh, oral or written comprehension is something that, that they struggle with. But I, I remember, you know, saying the excuse that uh, I couldn't memorize Scripture. I just, you know, I couldn't. It wouldn't stay with me. And then I realized um, I was a pr pretty much a lifelong Beatles fan. They, 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 were, they were huge uh, around the time I was born, I guess, so I kind of discovered them later on when I was maybe 10 or 11 or 12. And, uh, well, here's, here's a little something. I, I don't know if this is anything to brag about. I don't believe it is. Uh, but name any Beatles song. I'll tell you the words. Any. Go ahead. Yesterday, all my troubles seemed so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Yeah, uh, that, that's a very easy one. I can do the... But any more obscure ones? Oh, dear, what can I do? Baby's in black and I'm feeling blue. Tell me, oh, what will I do? She thinks of him, right? That, yeah, okay. Any others? Yeah, love me do. Love, love me do. Yeah, I'll always love you. I'll always be true. So please, love me do. Yeah, um... But, but you can't, you can't, you can't stump me. And I didn't work hard to memorize those. I didn't sit down and say, I'm going to memorize every Beatles song. You know, I just spent time listening, sometimes looking at the, you know, the, the, the little paper fold, the, the sleeve that the record comes in and reading along the lyrics, and it's all in there. And folks, there are so many things that are in us. I'm not saying whether having the Beatles music in me is good or bad. Uh, you can judge me all you want about that. But we all have stuff in us. And we're like sponges. We don't create knowledge. We don't create what we know. That's already been done. But what we can do is choose the source, right? So that we're being formed and shaped by a reliable source of truth. And uh, we can all do this. Um, Scripture is the very truth of God, and it's not the invention of men. It's true. You can rely on it. You don't have to have doubts. You can have questions, but, but you can rely on its truth. Kevin DeYoung said, I'll give my life for an exclamation point, but I won't give my life for a question mark. A few years ago in an article in Christianity Today, there's a guy named Tim Stafford, and he wrote of a teacher named Stephen Bolinsky. And Stephen Bolinsky 
whenever he teaches a class, he starts each class with a big jar full of beans. And he asks all the new students in his class uh, to guess or to estimate how many beans are in the jar. And he takes a big pad of paper and he writes down their estimates. Then next to those estimates, he helps them make another list. Okay, so you've made your list, how many beans you think are in the jar. Now we're going to make another list. You're going to write down your favorite songs. What's your favorite song? Then he reveals the actual number of beans that are in the jar, and the whole class looks at their estimates to see who was closest, you know, who, who won, who, who got it right or, or close. And after they determine that, then Belinsky turns to the list of favorite songs, and he says to the students, well, which of these songs is the closest to being right? What's the right song? And of course, the students protest. Well, there's no right answer. You know, a person's favorite song is merely a matter of taste. It's just your own perspective. The number of beans in the jar, well, that's an actual finite number of beans. But deciding your favorite song is, well, you know, it's just a, a matter of personal preference or, or taste. So at that point, Belinsky, who holds a PhD in philosophy from Notre Dame, asks this. When you decide what to believe in terms of your faith, is it more like guessing the number of beans in the jar, or is it more like choosing your favorite song? And always, Belinsky says, from old as well as young, he gets the same answer. Choosing what you believe and choosing your faith is more like choosing your favorite song. And Stafford said, when Belinsky told me this, it just took my breath away. He said, is that the way it is? Do we just determine our own truth? Do we pick the one that suits us best, believe what we want to believe, and then confidently and stubbornly defend our positions at all costs? Who cares if, if you're wrong, right? Because it's your right. It's offensive for somebody to suggest that maybe you're wrong. And that's a default mode when it comes to a worldview for many people. We determine our worldview by a little narrow slice of our life observation, experience, and feelings, or even worse, by listening to the majority and being wafted by the prevailing winds and whims of opinion, at best a pooling of ignorance, at worst a mindless subjective preference. So in her Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, Oprah Winfrey, in the 2018 Golden Globes, uh, she was presented that award, and she said, what I know for sure, I'll, I'll quote, what I know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. Your truth. Only today could that make sense to somebody. Um, your truth. That's just, well, it's stupid. I mean, uh, but those two words are so entrenched in our lexicon today that we hardly recognize them for the incoherent nightmare they are. Among other things, the philosophy of your truth destroys family when dad suddenly decides his truth is calling him to a new lover, a new family, or maybe even a new gender. It's a philosophy that can destroy entire societies because invariably one person's truth will go to battle with another person's truth and devoid of reason or absolute only power decides the victor. Your truth also puts an incredible self-justifying burden on the individual. It does. It, it, it chains us. It, it chains us. It tethers us. It, it binds us. Because if we're all self-made projects whose destinies are wholly ours to discover and implement, then uh, life becomes a rat race of performative individuality. Live your truth autonomy is as exhausting as it is incoherent, and depression is the inevitable outcome. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have any agency. We still have agency. We still get to choose. Uh, we can choose the sources of where we look for truth. We can choose how we synthesize and uh, uh, apply it as wisdom in everyday circumstances. But we don't get to invent the truth. We search it out in the pages of the Bible and accept it with gratitude, even when it's at odds with our feelings or preferences or the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. 
And in this crazy world that we live in, we need to say, I'm going to live no matter what anybody else does. In these last days, I'm going to live by those God-breathed words of Scripture. I saw a cartoon one day, showed an old man with a sign, and the sign said, repent. And he's walking around in the streets of the city and telling people to repent. Anybody that will listen, listen, repent, people. Repent. What you're doing is going to kill you the way you're living. It's not good. It'll ruin your life. You need to change. You need to repent. And everybody just scoffed at him and laughed at him. And finally, someone came up to the old man and said, old man, why, why do you keep doing that? Why do you insist on doing this? Uh, nobody's hardly listening, and, and nobody, nobody's going to change. You're not going to change anybody. And the old man looked at him and said, I'm not doing this not just to change them. I'm doing this so that they won't change me. Your Lord Jesus said in Matthew 7, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on a rock. And the rains came and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, but it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the solid rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. A great crash. People who build their lives on my truth, your truth. There's an ugly crash coming. Maybe you've already seen it. And I'm inviting you today, Jesus is inviting you today to build your house on the rock because you are God made and the scripture is God breathed. And in that scripture, you'll be directed toward faith in Christ which is able to make you wise unto salvation and able to make you stand in the hard times and in the last of the last days, should they be upon us. We participate in the Lord's Supper every week together here at Emmaus. So um, there is a kit with the juice and the bread on each side of the room. And if you would like to participate, please go ahead and make your way to one of those tables and uh, grab uh, an emblem for use here. These are very tangible symbols of what God has accomplished on our behalf, what he's purposed for us and what he's done. Uh, like the word, this is something that you can absorb and experience and use as a contemplative tool to think about, really think intently on what the Lord has done for you. There's a sense in which the Lord's Supper can also, in its own way, act as a mirror. You know that, right? Because the scripture says, examine yourself before you partake. Examine yourself. I don't know if we slow down and examine ourselves very often. Maybe we're afraid to because we don't know what we might see. But take some time to examine your heart as we partake of these emblems today. Jesus died on the cross. He was tortured. He went there as the perfect lamb of God and gave up his life, bearing the sins of the world. And he rose again to give us life. And he brought us a new promise, a new covenant through his blood that we can count on, that is rock solid. Jesus took the bread and he blessed it, saying, this is my body, Take and eat. Jesus also took the cup, 
saying, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, in an unstable world, you are stability. In a world of chaos and confusion, you are truth. In a world of isolation and loneliness, you are a companion. In a word flooded with information, you reveal truth to us. We see truth in your son, Jesus, the word. So, Father, we pray that we might seek and search after, that we might choose wisely the things that are informing us and shaping us. Help us to do that this week as we go from here, to choose to feed our eyes and our minds and our hearts with truth that we can build on. So when the storms come, we will not be shaken. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, for his sacrifice on the cross, and I thank you for his church, his mighty church, Lord. Revive us, use us. Help us to lean on you, to absorb your word, and to share that word with others, because it's good news. It's life and death. Father, thank you now, in Jesus' name, amen. Is a yes and
is faithful to his promises and he goes with us and uh, keep his word in mind and keep his promises in mind and, and live that way and have a have a great week.